Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jared McCormick. I am a clinical assistant professor here in the Kevorkian Center and the director of graduate studies. Delighted to welcome you to the final um, and eighth uh, event that we've had this year in the elements of border and infrastructure. This is fire number two. So for those of you where this might be your first time, this is a series that is metaphorically, playfully trying to think about the four elements, using each of them in the fall for an event and a second version in the spring um, to think about time, space, movement, belonging in different ways. And so we are delighted to wrap up the series um, and we are going more to the GCC dealing with cities fire, combustion, energy, um, the core of, of how um, these things maybe are realized in cities. I'm gonna keep my remarks uh, pretty short, but I wanted to uh, just plug a conference that we are planning here in the Kevorkian Center for Global Uprising. Global Uprising was an online series all last year I think made up of about 10 or 12 different online events. And so this is a capstone that we will be holding. It's the first in-person event that we will be having at the center since COVID. And you can see in the chat more information about that. Um, so without further ado, we will be going in the order from the website. So um, once someone starts speaking, their full bio and information will be there in text. Uh, we'll be starting with Natasha um, Eskandar, and then Ali Ismail Karimi, and then Feras Klenk, um, in that order. Uh, everybody has about 10 minutes, so that's about 30 minutes, and then I'll have a couple questions, and then we'll open up to the audience for Q&A. I just wanted to encourage anyone, as people are speaking, if you wanted to put a book reference, a website, a question in the in the chat, feel free to do that. You can also message uh, Fidel or myself, um, any questions. And at the end, you'll be able to unmute, show your face if you want, um, and we'll, we'll add you in and you can ask your question. Um, so with that, we will get started. And for fire number two, so Natasha, it's all you. Thanks, Jared, for, for inviting me. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, one second. Can you all see that? Perfect. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so um, I wanted to take seriously this uh, provocation about thinking about fire uh, in relationship to urbanism in the GCC. Um, and so today I, I'm going to talk a little bit about how climate change uh, logics are shaping patterns of urbanization in Qatar, uh, uh, particularly around urban exclusion, and what that might um, encourage us to think about in thinking about cities around the world. Um, the material here draws from my book. I won't go into too much about the book, but just in case you want to read more, this is where you can find it. Does skill make us human? Um, Qatar has been making itself for a very long time in dramatic bursts of construction from 1960 onward. This is Doha in 2008. Um, please pay attention to this, this uh, triangle here. This, you'll see it in another slide. Um, but Qatar's latest burst of self-making was supercharged after it was awarded the 2022 FIFA World Cup for Soccer hosting rights in 2010. Qatar began the massive construction required for the games almost immediately, funneling hundreds of billions of dollars to reinvent itself as a global destination for sports and culture. And here we have that same skyline just a decade later. Uh, this is the previous, this is the same shoreline as the previous slide, um, anchored by the hurricane building, which is this one, and the Sheraton Pyramid uh, right here. Um, you can see the dramatic and remarkable transformation um, that has taken place. The, the shoreline is a jostle of iconic building next to iconic building, each designed by a different star architect. 
um, in the interlude between the two photos of Doha that I've shown here, between 2008 and 2018, the city more than tripled its footprint. It upgraded its infrastructure with an integrated rail project that is the largest civil engineering project in the world, built a new port, a new airport, a new naval base, and a new economic zone. Um, the buildings that have received the most attention over the past few months are the eight stadia built for the World Cup. Each of these represents an outstanding design achievement uh, with innovative uh, engineering, uh, geothermal cooling systems, et cetera, and so forth. But the stadia represent only a tiny fraction of the development over the past decade, some $4 billion out of an estimated 300 billion. Development has expanded outward into the bay. The Pearl Qatar in Doha is an artificial island spanning four kilometers, um, and it's the largest luxury mixed use development in the Middle East today. A few kilometers north of Doha, Lusail City extends outward into the sea on four man-made islands totaling almost 40 kilometers squared. The massive development has been funded through hydrocarbon revenues. Um, and to ensure the, uh, the presence or the access to those revenues, Qatar has also upgraded its liquefied natural gas processing facilities. This is the uh, Barzan LNG processing facility. Um, and, but Qatar has, in addition to this, invested in the construction of six new underground wells, bridges, pipes, subsea manifolds, um, and this is really a bargain for Qatar at about 50 billion. In its ambitions to make itself, Qatar has adopted a modernist approach to social and urban development. Um, and in this respect, it is similar to other countries throughout the Gulf. Um, think of Saudi's uh, linear city, um, which it has on, on tap. Uh, while modernism is often considered an aesthetic, it is actually a development method that reverses the standard approach uh, of urban development, which strives to create a future for and with people. Modernism, by contrast, defines an idealized version for people and then compels them to comply with the future envisioned. Um, it is absolutely top down. Um, in Qatar, the design for the future was defined and then people were imported to fit this vision of the future. Um, and uh, this very much depended on a, on a twofold set, set of resources. One, a top-down political structure, and two, the resources to make this, hard, to make this happen. Here, I just want to point out Lucille. This is a planned city for uh, 450,000 workers. It's going to come on, it's already kind of coming online now, designed to come online in time for the World Cup in a few months. It's the largest smart city in the world. Um, and currently it has its plan for, and this is important, 250,000 residents, 160,000 workers which, who are not defined as residents, and 90,000 visitors. And the yellow areas here are residential, but there are different shades of yellow uh, with some elite residential and some uh, not so elite residential. And uh, specific tracks meant for the 160,000 workers. To a very real extent, Qatar, Qatar's modernist bet has worked. Qatar's population has grown with the expansion of the city. It has imported the people it has needed to inhabit this vision uh, of itself as a global center for sports and culture. Um, but this, of course, uh, has been fueled by hydro hydrocarbon revenues, and Qatar has developed it itself in big bursts of construction each time there has been kind of a, a, a peak in oil prices globally. Um, and so these are the same kind of big uh, development pushes throughout Qatar's modern history, and each of those big pushes corresponds with a rise in global oil prices. Um, the organizing principle of these modernist pushes uh, is exclusion. Um, this is 
articulated very explicitly in Qatar's National Development Vision 2030. There are many other national development visions throughout the Gulf, but mm -hmm. Qatar's in particular uh, positions Qatar as a place that wants to remake itself as a platform for a knowledge economy populated by elite knowledge workers um, and uh, does not envision uh, the city for anyone who is not an elite worker or an elite person. Um, excluded from this vision are the workers who built Qatar. The workforce in Qatar is 95% foreign in the economy as a whole, but in construction, it is 100% foreign with the exception of maybe a thousand Qataris out of a million. Um, the workforce is profoundly international with workers from Mozambique to Nepal. Uh, every country is represented in the construction industry in Qatar. The majority though are from South Asia and the Middle East, uh, increasingly North Africa. Um, in its urban plan, Qatar has explicitly planned for exclusion. It has planned who to include in its new vision, who to welcome, but it has also planned who to exclude and who it will omit for the future it has planned out for itself. Uh, since 20, uh, 2005, Qatar has banned by law workers it classifies as unskilled and here regardless of their actual ability. Uh, and it's called these workers bachelors, blue collar workers, manual laborers. It has excluded them from the city they have built. The government has published color coded maps indicating which areas of the city unskilled workers are prohibited from residing in and in practice from circulating in. Um, this is enforced by both the police and by private security um, and violation of these uh, regulations results in detention and deportation. And so here, this gray area, the industrial area is the area that is uh, uh, designated for workers to live in. The area where workers are housed is zoned for industrial use with, uh, in addition to labor camps, it has cement factories, chemical plants, construction material storage, equipment, parking, and, and labor camps for workers. Um, you can see it looks very different than the shiny Doha the workers have built. Um, and the conditions in the labor camps are uh, middling to abysmal as documented by the international press and, and various human rights organizations. Um, in response to this, uh, Qatar has, in response to these complaints, Qatar has built Labor City, which it opened in 2015. Uh, this is um, kind of a high end form of exclusion that comes with a security upgrade as well. The barracks here are monitored by security guards, allowing no unsanctioned exit or entry, entry especially by journalists and human rights workers. Um, there are CCTV cameras everywhere and workers report, report phone and internet monitoring, especially um, uh, through geolocation of workers. So what I wanna say here in the last couple of minutes left uh, in my talk is that this uh, urban exclusion actually uh, follows patterns of climate damage um, and uses climate pressures to accentuate this form of urban exclusion such that uh, the privileged areas of Doha are uh, characterized by climate protection, whereas workers are subjected to the ravages of climate damage. Um, and the um, compelling piece of this narrative is that this climate damage is of course a product of the very hydrocarbons that are fueling literally this development model um, with the idea that the climate damage will participate in the ultimate erasure of the workers who built the city. So I, I just wanna point out two things, heat and, and climate damage as part of recruitment. Um, Jared, you can cut me off whenever you feel like I've gone on too long. Oh, you're good. Okay, Qatar is, is hot. It is the one of the fastest warming places on the planet due to its geography and, and to the specifics of climate change dynamics. Uh, this graph shows the increase of temperatures that, it, so this is 2020 right here. Um, and it's not in temperatures, it's in a metric called the wet 
bulb globe temperature, which is designed to measure the effect of, the, of heat on the body. It's a composite of ambient uh, and radiative temperatures, humidity, and wind shear. So you can see here that the, the trend line is pretty dramatic. Um, so this, uh, the wet bulb globe temperature uh, metric uh, establishes safe work under different uh, temperatures. And so uh, these are the temperatures under, uh, uh, it indicates the amount of work uh, that is safe under each temperature condition. Um, these are the temperatures that characterize Qatar in, in most summer months. I'll show you that in more detail. But what this has resulted in is a high rate of worker deaths and, and uh, heat injury, which results in, in organ damage, particularly to the kidneys and heart. Um, and these are not do not appear necessarily as occupational injury. They are classified as death from natural causes. Um, and yet these are most definitely uh, a product of workers being exposed to heat during their, their, during their work. So this is the line at which 15 minutes of work per hour with adequate hydration, so two cups an hour is allowed or is safe. And you can see here that this, these are the temperatures for Qatar. Um, this, for most of the summer months, uh, uh, you, you cannot work at, in Qatar. It, it exceeds the 15 minutes per hour line. For, for uh, temperatures that are life-threatening to a body at rest, not working, Qatar has exceeded those temperatures uh, at, from 2003 onward. Um, right, so... Uh, Qatar has imposed a new safety line for heat uh, above which uh, work is prohibited, a temperature above which work is prohibited. You can see here that it is far below the temperatures throughout the summer months, and it is already located in the life-threatening area so that it uh, allows for work in conditions that are life-threatening to a body at rest. Um, companies, uh, engage in a series of practices to try and mitigate these, but these are largely symbolic. And there are lots of claims about workers being able to self-pace, which they cannot. Anyone who's been on a construction site in Qatar can tell you this. The protective measures for workers are uh, often absent, as this indicates. Uh, long lines to use the bathroom in the heat, which also produces vulnerabilities for workers. Uh, this is a cooling room, uh, which is meant to provide workers a place to cool in the heat. You can see here it's empty. Uh, this, is, this photo was taken in the summer months, and this is because workers are uh, discouraged from using uh, protective measures. The second and final very quick piece here is climate damage. Um, Companies in Qatar are, incre are increasingly looking to areas that have suffered climate damage, rising sea levels, chronic drought, and other kinds of climate damage to recruit workers. Uh, the reason that these areas are attractive to companies in Qatar is that the workers here are newly poor. These are areas that were better off before climate damage pressures uh, and are selected based on the fact that they were better off before climate damage pressures. And so uh, people benefited from prior investments in human development, so health, education, et cetera. Um, and, uh, this makes them attractive to employers in Qatar because it means that workers have the ability to learn construction skills, the advanced construction skills necessary to build in Qatar very fast. Um, so what's happened here is that the model for recruitment has shifted from a model of recruiting persons, which is the model that uh, governs uh, regulations to protect workers under conditions of recruitment. Uh, the model has shifted from that to a model of recruiting places. Um, and companies in Qatar working with recruiters in countries of origin have developed incredibly good intelligence about areas that are uh, sustaining climate damage, often much better intelligence than the scientific literature can provide. And they are actively drawing climate damage into their business model and into production. They are uh, having effects of restructuring the recruitment industry in profound ways. 
uh, such that climate damage is being transformed into a business resource to yield uh, low cost workers who have uh, the skills and the development to learn quickly. And so with that I'll end and I'll just suggest here that Qatar for me is always a window onto a future. The dynamics there are extreme uh, because of geography, because of the, uh, the, the mix of the economy and because of the fact that the, the economy is um, almost exclusively dependent on uh, migrant labor and migrant workers. Um, and so Qatar perhaps offers a window on what we might expect uh, when we think about the ways that hydrocarbons are driving urbanization patterns around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. Ali, you are up next. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jared, for the invitation, also to the Kaborkin Center uh, for, the, for organizing the talk. Um, as was mentioned, I'm an architect based in the Gulf. I'm based in Bahrain, and I'm a co-principal of a practice called Civil Architecture, which operates between Bahrain and Kuwait. Our work look, uh, looks predominantly at the landscape of the Gulf and its ecology in terms of architectural production. We attempt to leverage exhibitions, installations, and writing as ways of countering the expediency that characterizes most of the architectural landscape within the region. So sort of building a context or groundwork for us to operate within uh, through the lens of this kind of cultural production. Uh, today, I'll be speaking quickly within the lens, uh, lens of um, total exhaustion and kind of uh, also touching upon these kind of post-peripheral landscapes. And as carbon-based life forms exhausting primarily carbon-based matter, and specifically on architectural endeavors, it seems to me to be appropriate to talk within the context of fire uh, on the kind of on its after effects on this kind of exhaustion, at least in, in particular as it relates to the Gulf. Uh, so I'll be giving kind of a much a speculative look or a reading of, of one landscape and then talking maybe a bit more concretely about a specific project and its way of tackling um, these changing landscapes. For the past century, the, the Gulf has, has been at the heart of maybe the world's metabolism. The Gulf, uh, a tepid pool of warm salt water exhausts with a kind of with each passing year, it sources of fresh water. It exhausts the body of water on on which it sits, or in kind of which, in which its livelihood is kind of based on. It exhausts its imported labor and it's also its oil, in part through war and in part through construction. Um, it's it's a peripheral landscape in in larger global sense, or had been until maybe the twentieth century, and yet it's it's one in which all that can be consumed is consumed. And what remains is a reflection of this global condition. And kind of as Natasha had mentioned, it's, it's maybe a place that's peripheral and from some lenses, maybe from a cultural lens or from the lens of certain forms of production. But on the other hand, is very much central to understanding the, the larger forces and dynamics which, which the world um, is subject to. And it's also a region in which this imperative to expedite progress is largely an inherited one. It's a product of the region's time as a series of protectorates. And this notion of progress is part of the leg legitimacy and legibility project that began under colonial rule or under the rule of um, the British Empire as in, in these forms of protectorates. And so this notion of progress, which I'll also kind of talk through these in the coming images, the notion of progress in these client states to me is at least a, a worrying one where one wonders if it's a sort of aimless progress that leads into anything except the expedited dissipation of energy. And in this kind of mechanical model of, of the world in which progress is the idea, one wonders if in fact it's simply the expediting of a dissipation of energy, primarily petroleum, uh, to the point of ultimate exhaustion of all usable energy. Uh, so I'll be giving two examples. The first is, um, is maybe beginning with a landscape or thinking about the shifting relationship to the built environment around us as we see it in the, in the region. And then the other kind of beginning to think about ways of tackling it or at least talking about it. Um, so uh, the, f the first example is El Bar, or let's say the wilderness. It's the, it's the desert landscape that sits at the center of, um, of Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain's interior, Sikhir, is inhabited, inhabited by desert scrub and oil infrastructure for most of the year. Most of the, most of the interior of the island has not been developed because it's where the oil, um, oil company, Babco, uh, has its pump jacks and has its infrastructure. And so the area has been cordoned off to prevent any kind of construction other than oil infrastructure. But 
when the weather cools down and the sun softens its grip on the rocky plains, Khir quickly changes. The petrol landscape of transmission towers, donkey pumps, pump jacks becomes this backdrop to a city of camping tents. So from November to March, people of various backgrounds and walks of life come to the desert to imagine this sort of second life for themselves. Some go to spend the night away from the family and the relative quiet. Uh, others go to grill and drink. Some go to get in touch with their Bedouin origins. Uh, Sakhir's status as an interior desert is, is largely protected by its use as a landscape of extraction. So protected not for its environmental conditions or the idea of a desert or even this kind of need for a space to, um, to escape from the city, increasingly, which increasingly encroaches on uh, all, well, everywhere in Bahrain except the desert. Um, but, but in fact, uh, it's protected primarily because of the value of what lies beneath its surface. Around five kilometers in width and a dozen kilometers long, Sakhir is less a desert in size and more a desert as an ideological and cultural fascination. And despite being a 15 minute drive from any coast or any urban area, uh, the scrubland of Sakhir continues to represent the sort of point of origin or a place to return to that gives it this cultural capital as a counterpoint to, to the rest of Bahrain or the cities of Bahrain. Uh, but the reality of Sakhir and this kind of contradiction between the place where these tents would get put up and people would go and retreat in the winter and the reality of it is that it's perhaps just as banal. Um, it's a scattering of tents. It's essentially has become a tent city. Um, and in Bahrain's semi-barren plain is, often looks more like its cities than any desert. And what had been maybe a scattering of uh, tents a decade ago now increasingly resembles the suburbia that many of the campers have decided to leave. The tents are closer to single family villas, boasting electricity, plumbing, playstations, air conditioning, all encircled by a fabric bound wall. And the provision of paved roads, amusement parks, pop-up tents, and McDonald's have all com completed the area's transformation from campground to textile metropolis. So the desert exists today as a collective idea, a landscape that is less a reality and more an imagined condition of interiority. For some, it remains a kind of ersatz nedge. For others, a pillowy second home crisscrossed by wires and pipelines. However, for all, Sphere is an experiment on the idea of the desert. And the idea of the desert, in this case, with, um, with, with, fl with the flare stacks in the background, even more so this kind of image of desolation and fantasy. And to me, to me, this is interesting, or this is a condition that interests us. Maybe in, in the sense that before even tackling the notion of, of the exhaustion of, of materiality or the exhaustion of, of, of petroleum or the exhaustion of any resource or even the exhaustion of space, I think the first thing is almost redressing or even thinking about the ecological visions, which are also equally exhausted. So in this case, one imagines that even the idea of the desert exists in lieu of the desert. And in the case of Sakhir, there in fact is no desert. There's not even the illusion of a desert. So on one hand, al bar or the wilderness is, is a very real uh, condition. It exists out there. It exists in Saudi Arabia. But in places like Bahrain, it also sh shows us that um, the remapping of a biome into a temporary city, into this almost dystopian glamping, uh, is not only a condition that perhaps summarizes the possibilities uh, of elsewhere in the region uh, as ur uh, kind of urban development further encroaches on these spaces, but it's, a, it's also a glimpse at a post-oil condition, right, where this landscape, uh, once uh, Bahrain runs out of its oil and it'll be the first place in the Gulf, presumably, to do so, this landscape created and marked by lines may soon be discarded. And so the remediation of these landscapes is a question playing out not only in the future, but actually in the present, where the need to kind of rec recoup and reclaim this own infrastructure is a project that occurs at the, at the very moment. The documentation of this desert condition brought us to a project we've been working on for the past year. Uh, and it's in fact kind of a counterpoint to the, to the ecological question of the desert. Um, next to next to this here on the fringes of the, of the kind of oil infrastructure and on the fringes of the camping sites, next to these oil pumps is a small quarry. And for the past 50 years, that quarry has supplied all limestone on the island. I show this project because on one hand, it's a small scale project. Uh, in fact, it's almost laughably small. It's a, it's, uh, but on the other hand, it's a way for us to talk about maybe we, on, on, a, on the smallest of scales, how, the, how at all scales, the larger economic and geological questions uh, can be expressed and expressed not abstractly, but in tangible ways and expressed not conceptually, but also on an economic spectrum and with a kind of a latent economic uh, drive. And so 
for, for people who've been to the Gulf, the island country of Bahrain has expanded its landmass by 30% over the past 50 years, and it's done so through reclamation. Uh, using dre primarily dredged sand, so sand that's been pumped up from the sea floor, washed and cleaned, and then used uh, for either construction or used to, for reclamation. And then the, ba the boundaries of this reclaimed uh, land are fixed using armored seawalls composed of limestone from a single quarry in the middle of the island. Now, the reclamation is used to fuel speculative real estate, so allowing for free land to constantly be pumped into the property market when property uh, prices increase to the point that they're unsustainable or to the point where the average government employee or the average worker in Bahrain is unable to afford them. So there's this constant uh, back and forth between the introduction of land and the ability also for the government to quickly monetize that land, right? So to be able to dredge it, to be able to sell it off to developers, and this becomes this kind of trade-off where the... The trade-offs are water, qual water quality, ecological damage, these long-term effects on the on the seafloor and on uh, marine life. However, in the calculation where the land the land is introduced to the property market, these things sort of exist outside the the spectrum and outside the the, calcu the calculations. And, and to this day, um, the rock for these projects and the dredge sand costs a nominal municipal fee. And I'll kind of touch on that also in a little bit in the next slide. So uh, recently I was working on a project, uh, 40 houses in Bahrain, and uh, we, I realized that the fill material for these 40 houses to, to kind of even the site cost $30,000. The market price for equivalent fill material should have been a million dollars. And so immediately the question came up, well, why is the fill material so much cheaper than, than market rates? Um, and so the, 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 what we realized is for all government projects, the, the stone and the, the fill material from the quarry is effectively free. Um, it's not free, but it's heavily subsidized. And of course, this, now, this is also not a kind of, uh, the, the, the quarry itself is also running out. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a condition which obviously because of the, the, the also the, the value factor, it's not a condition that can go on forever. So, Upon a visit to the quarry, we realized, in fact, not only is the quarry depleting, but over the 40 years, the quarry has been almost depleted. And there are three to five years left on the of quarryable limestone on the island from at least this quarry, unless another area in the island is uh, sectioned for, for quarrying. Um, and so the, the question immediately emerged, well, what has happened that within 50 years, an entire geological layer on this island has been crushed, dispersed, and broken down to create these new shorelines? And also, where, where again, where had the value values been placed in the larger economic spectrum that asked, well, what happens after 40 years of, uh, of kind of excavation and, and using this quarry? What, what happens? Uh, and so the idea is that within the, within the coming years, uh, all armored seawalls and all armored rock would have to be imported from elsewhere in the region. So suddenly there's not only a kind of the exhaustion of, of Koribal limestone in Bahrain, but in fact, uh, the, also the tying in of Ras al-Khaim and Saudi Arabia into filling the need for Koribal limestone. And so there was a competition for the for a public bench in the UNESCO Perling Path recently, and we proposed to use blocks of limestone from the quarry. Uh, we looked at methods of cutting limestone, angle grinders or diamond wire saws, and the rule that we had kind of given ourselves was that the work shouldn't take more than a day's grinding, or three cuts with the machine, so back, base, and seat. Um, and, and so the, these were the initial prototypes, a bucket bench, uh, a bucket table, a bench, different angles and different seat angles. And there's maybe a whole other conversation that we can have, which, is, which would just be about, um, about labor versus machining. And one of the things that we had found was this kind of strange inverted axes of time, cost, and labor, where human labor and machine labor are weighed in, in kind of on completely different scales and the machine, the, the machining of a bench was in fact far more expensive than having someone work on it for four or five times the, the time uh, because of the factors, for example, that Natasha mentioned. The benches were produced for twice the cost of the standard concrete bench. And what allowed the project to happen essentially w was that for each, a ton of limestone in Bahrain costs $3. Um, and so immediately the, the ability to make a proposal for, for a public bench undercut pretty much all other, it, it undercut all other competitors because it was able to suddenly get to such a cheap 
it, it, it suddenly became an extremely cheap proposal for also and it's extremely scalable. And um, and the fact was that it, because because of this kind of strange condition of the quarry, and the fact that it, it had been so subsidized for so long, the price had been fixed as a way of subsidizing the government's development and as a way of subsidizing these larger endeavors. That it's very easy to kind of piggyback off it and do something that's from the scale of the quarry completely negligible in cost because the amounts are so small. The beach, uh, the benches were placed on the, along the last sandy shoreline in Harak at the end of the Perling Path, the, the last shoreline that hasn't been reclaimed. And they sit near the dock in the fort, uh, fort which is com uh, composed of quarried limestone, uh, sorry, cor quarried coral stone rather than limestone. And so the end, uh, the, in the end, the project was, uh, was, I mean, it, it's almost a silly project, and and we don't really believe, at least as architects, in making benches. Um, but we had we held a small event, a, a portrait session along the beach with a local artist and photographer, and it was a chance to just get people using these chairs, visiting them, and talking about where they're from, what they're made of. Um, but for but really for us, it was actually kind of a way of telling people there is a quarry. And once people kind of realized there was a quarry, the follow up question or follow up question was, oh, how long is it open? How 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 can we visit it? Where can we go? And the reality was that no, it's closing in three years. And so that we, I, get, I present this project kind of in conjunction with the previous landscape because it's a way of talking also about other things that are exhausted, but along the path of, of progress or along the path of this kind of transformation of oil into construction uh, or oil into cities. I mean, Bahrain has passed peak limestone before it passes peak oil, but mm -hmm. it's another and it's another depleting resource on the trajectory of this development. And while the po project is a bench project, uh, the idea was to think about how we can exhibit the quarry, and maybe at its most fundamental, the quarry is is the is the project, and the bench is an exhibition or a moving exhibition about the uh, about the quarry. But fundamentally, it's about a scaling up of an argument, it's, or scaling down rather. It's a way of pointing at the costs and contradictions that underlie the building industry. And so, the notion of a public bench in this case isn't a design question. It's not about the bench. It's actually about the public. Uh, and you think about the quarry as a public amenity and how an entire element of Bahrain's geological com uh, composition has been used and where the hidden savings were. Um, I mean, in, in a project that might cost 10 million dinars, 1 million in hidden savings because of cheap labor or cheap stone is, a, is, is, kind of, is where the profit might be made. It's what pays for the consultant. It's what accounts for the contractor's fees in the project. However, it's it's something that's not added to the equation. So it's it's where it's where profit is made, but costs aren't calculated. And so the, the bench itself is not a form of architecture. In fact, it might not even be a form of furniture. It's a synecdoche of sorts, and it's a way about talking about larger changes in the building industry, and about how a strat of a stratum of an island nation has been with, over the course of fifty years in the process of extraction, transportation, and exhaustion lost lost in an equation where it's, it hasn't even been accounted for. Thank you. Ali, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I wrote down so many things there, but peak limestone. Um, and so let's move on to Ferris. All right, everybody. My name is Firas. I um, want to thank the Kevorkian Center for inviting me and um, I want to thank my fellow panelists for their excellent talks. Really enjoyed listening about that and um, yeah, really fascinating stuff. Um, so this is so what I'm presenting today is based off my dissertation research back in 2016, where I was looking into the questions of entrepreneurship in Amman. So as some of you might know, entrepreneurship, um, specifically in its Silicon Valley like model, is very big in the GCC countries. This is seen as a way to generate high economic growth um, uh, for the economy and to transform and to move away from you know to sidestep questions of peak oil as Ali discussed, but also as um, Dr. Natasha Skander talked about, like being up with the questions of like, who is the valuable uh, worker? So um, in my case, I was just, I was examining how um, the question of entrepreneurship was received in the money uh, context, right? This kind of this global discourse was localized. Um, you know, and, it, and in some ways it was a top, top bottom approach, you know, the state, you know, saying that you must become an entrepreneur. This is a national duty. This is back uh, when Sultan Qaboos was still alive, um, but also how it was appropriated by many young Omanis on the ground 
as a way of self-development, um, you know, betterment, kind of almost a process of individuation, as they told me when I was conducting uh, my field work. So, and so how did this manifest on the, the kind of the urban fabric of Muscat? Uh, not so much, to be honest uh, with you. I mean, from what I understand, talking to like local uh, architects, uh, Muscat has, at least uh, they hinted at that. It was, I never really followed up, but they suggested that, um, the reason why like Muscat did not have all the kind of like the fancy buildings like Doha or you know Abu Dhabi or Dubai was precisely this focus on heritage. So um, you know, kind of focusing on the history of like Muscat, history of uh, Amman. So instead, a lot of these energies. And here, when I talk about energy, I mean obviously this is all funded eventually by hydrocarbon, you know, revenue that's standing in the, in the background. In this case, I'm talking about like uh, hu human energy, right? It's like many of these people were really excited um, to be part of this like global um, almost movement. That's how some referred it to uh, being an entrepreneur that like anything was possible. Very, um, I would say like idealist project. So in terms, again, going back to the terms of the urban fabric, um, many of them were opening up new stores that uh, kind of like small businesses. So there's a, a question of what kind of entrepreneurship are we talking about? Um, but many also open like accelerators, um, uh, co-working spaces, and just host, uh, began hosting kind of informal events to, um, how, how would I put it? To kind of just promote, to talk about entrepreneurship, to create spaces, right? Like you just come, you know, you come meet at a, at a cafe, you know, 7 p.m., grab coffee. Let's just talk about business uh, opportunities, Let's talk about entrepreneurial like best practices. Um, for example, um, keeping a notebook by your bedside. So when you wake up and have a good business idea, you'll jump and write it down before you forget. I mean, at the, I recall at the time thing kind, I thought that was, you know, kind of silly, but you know, this is what people did, um, but not only in the GCC context, is in, in a global uh, context um, as well. So um, in one of the sites where I conducted my field work, um, it was called Arudha, and it was a co-working space, one of Oman's first. And I believe, I think they have expanded since then. There's more, but that was one that was created, you know, kind of for youth, you know, by youth, where they kind of, you know, um, took kind of like these kind of global aesthetics of co-working spaces. And by that, that kind of, if you can imagine, I'm sorry, I don't have... Um, any slides on me today, um, kind of like Ikea-like furniture, right? Kind of this Nordic style minimalism that was like imported um, to, um, to mascots and then it was kind of brightly painted, you know, heather mechanic, you know, this is your space, this, um, uh, you know, stay hungry, you know, kind of, kind of like popular like slogans, you know, you would probably encounter in any sort of like entrepreneurial local working spaces, like work hard, play hard, you know, there'd be like a coffee machine um, on the side, which was, you know, symbolic of like long working hours. So you would have people, it would, um, you have people working like, you know, in, in theory, like 12 hour work days, and they would um, juxtapose kind of like that energy, right, their personal energy, vis-a-vis -vis the government worker, who, you know, they would complain that, you know, you know, goes, comes to office at 10am, and then leaves by like two o'clock, you know, and they're not contributing to the national effort of like transforming the national economy away from, from oil, from hydrocarbon uh, revenues. Um, and instead, you know, and if, if anything, they're taking away from it, they're costing. So there was kind of hints of there, these were kind of like almost of social parasites of sorts. You know, if they really actually cared, they would be doing their job at the very least. Um, but instead, you know, they're just kind of, you know, just leaving work because that's sort of the kind of cultural expectation. So um, in some ways for them, um, they saw this, this kind of this entrepreneurial movement as a sort of like cultural revolution of sort. I mean, you know, quote unquote, of that kind of recreating the individual, make, you know, make, make them hardworking, uh, make them responsible, but also as a process of like reforming society, you know, everyone is now kind of, should be now more responsible you know, to themselves and each other um, in a way which the state would uh, tap into um, as well, right? We would have a collection, a society of responsible individuals who would help transform this national econo economy um, 
away eventually, you know, from, you know, hydrocarbons toward constructing a knowledge uh, economy. Um, so so that, that's it, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we are going to get all of us up in the square here. And so I guess I just wanted to start. Um, first of all, thank you so much. The, one thing that's so amazing and I'm not going to say frustrating, but um, I think different than other events is these conversations that we've put together over our online series are really span disciplines and practice in such different ways. And so I really, all three of you, um, you've, you've brought so much to the conversation. So just for everyone, I just wanna remind you, feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, a little shortly after 1.30, we'll open it up for, for Q and A. But to get us started, I wanted to maybe ask a question of all three of you. Um, you know, one thing in, in coming up with, with the series for the year around elements, um, you know, with fire here, one thing that I was really thinking about was economic, the body, and the way that this, this conversation really happened was, 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 was around the city. And something that, that came up, I think, for all three of you was this idea of labor. And so, Natasha, you have you know, written and you briefly talked about it here, this idea of skill. Um, Ali, you know, you mentioned that making the benches machine versus labor or even kind of spilling off into AI and otherwise. And in Oman, even this idea of entrepreneurship and kind of coming together to kind of further um, business interests. And so I'm wondering if you guys might say something more ab about your project or where you're coming from specifically, or kind of in this conversation, how you see this labor work body relationship um, being realized, because it was a thread that really stood out to me from, from all three of you. Should I start just to, to, to follow sure. the order? Um, I actually want to say that I, I want to draw on Ali's talk to, to think about this question, um, this very helpful question that you asked, Jared. Um, and I, uh, am, I wanna enter this reflection by thinking about the trade-off between machines and bodies in Qatar's construction industry and the way that relates to the fact that it's funded by hydrocarbon. Um, so the, the industry actually grows in these bursts, right? And it's very project driven. There's no standing construction industry in Qatar. I mean, there's no standing labor force there. You know, once a company is awarded a project, it, it assembles uh, the subcontracting chain, it assembles the equipment and it assembles the labor. In some ways it's kind of a pop-up industry. There's no kind of like standing, industry that builds consistently. And what this means is that, um, right, so the, all of this has to happen very, very quickly. And there's a lot of chaos in the contracting process. So the chaos stems from the difficulty of Im importing different equipment and materials, um, the changes in design, uh, the regulatory structures and challenges with payment. So it, all of it is kind of chaotic and firms not only have to assemble, but they're all of these inputs of construction, but they're not always sure how they're gonna be able to stage their project. So that they're often doing things at the same time that in any other kind of setting would be staged differently. So they're doing foundation and wet work, even as they're doing finishes on the same structure. And this unpredictability means that firms favor labor over equipment. And the reason is that labor can be made to do anything, but a crane can only do a certain thing. An earth mover can only do a certain thing. So what you have is firms moving toward more labor intensive approaches away from more mechanized approaches uh, 
um, in order to be more flexible. Um, and, you know, they do this under conditions of extreme heat, exposing workers' bodies to extreme heat. And that for them is much cheaper than having an earth mover rust and devaluate when it's sitting around. In other words, it's much cheaper for a construction firm to have some percentage of the workers struggle with heat injury because they don't bear those costs. It's, and, and in fact, have some kind of like plausible deniability, right? But an, a crane or an earth mover just depreciates if it's not being used. Mm -hmm. And the heat, actually, the heat and humidity are, are very um, impactful on that equipment, right? So again, this is maybe this question of bodies, uh, equipment, materials, and the funding that fuels the construction industry, but also the impact of the heat, the impact of the fire in terms of climate. This is maybe to pick off of Natasha's point and speak purely about labor. I mean, um, it, it, it is on one hand, yeah, I, I think Natasha touched beautifully on kind of the, the way the, the calculation is made. And even when, when asking, for example, to get to these benches, the simplest calculation was someone saying, look, we don't want to tie up a machine because we need a machine for projects, whereas we can put two or three guys to, put, to work on this thing and it kind of doesn't matter. Um, but maybe to talk about this kind of other aspect to uh, to the larger kind of labor question as well is uh, just some of the things that played out in the beginning of the pandemic, I think were the first time almost where issues on labor rights, and this is only maybe for the first few months of the pandemic began, uh, an issue of kind of the space that they occupied began to enter kind of public discourse as a as a problem. And of course it didn't enter it from a kind of civil rights or human rights discussion, but purely from a, um, kind of the, the containing of, a, of the pandemic or the containing of this kind of pathogen within the system. And so um, partially the way housing for workers is resolved when not for the bigger con uh, kind of contractors who have their large dormitories is that the older parts of the, the older cities, so like Manam and Harag, you get uh, the co former courtyard homes being rented out to tw 10, 20, 30 men. And as a way of kind of reducing the cost of, of living, they'll share a gas canister or two gas canisters for cooking. And they'll go uh, throughout the day and have assigned hours. And the reason why so many fires happen, let's say in the older parts of the city is that at some point, someone who's, whose cooking time ends, leaves the gas on for the, someone who comes after him and the gas canister stays on. And over the last 10 years, uh, so many of the f fires that occur in these older parts of the city end up happening because of, because of these conditions. Um, and even then, this kind of precarity, this kind of the, the actual presence of flames within the old city didn't bring the discussion until with the pandemic, the fact that one person sick in a, in a courtyard house that had 25 or 30 people suddenly made 30 people sick and suddenly you'd have the whole neighborhood having to be kind of um, quarantined or locked up. And it was the only time really that the housing conditions and the, even the, the problems that the housing market failed or the fact that we never actually have to resolve the problem of housing for laborers in the housing market because we can also off, offset housing without restoring it or uh, older homes in the older neighborhoods without fixing them. It, uh, the pandemic is the only time it came up. And again, it only came up because it could be tied. It, it was tied to numbers. It was tied to numbers that were suddenly blanketed across the country. So suddenly these weren't isolated fires or isolated worker accidents. These were the number of cases in the country on the whole. And it was the only time within the context of kind of comparative governance that workers' rights became kind of a larger question. And it, and now again, it's fading away. But it's interesting thinking about, again, who is doing the metrics and how are the metrics done? And maybe it's not, a, maybe it should be a qualitative thing, but maybe we just need different metrics also for be, making these assessments and adding value. Right, well, and... I guess in the Hamani context, I mean, the people whom I interviewed, I mean, they were mostly either knowledge workers, or at least saw themselves as knowledge workers. So these were like programmers, you know, coders, or people who worked in the creative industry. So graphic designers, photographers, you know, uh, artists. And as I kind of already alluded to, um, you know, in my talk, 
uh, and, and this came up in various interviews and you know, participant observation, um, how they would contrast like their long hours of work, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the government worker, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, like the parents, you know, generation that they don't work hard enough. Um, so, you know, you would easily work, you know, at, they would work at least, at least some of them, they would claim, you know, like 12 hours, right? I would work all day. Uh, they would also contrast the, the space of where that work takes place, right? I don't have to work at an office anymore. I mean, they may have one, right? Or I may rent a desk and kind of like in a WeWorks type situation. Um, or I could work out of a, at a cafe. So here we're talking about different styles of work um, in terms of like, the body, I mean, the one person I remember I recall interviewing, he would talk about how eating healthy, he would only eat, you know, he had a vegan diet again, so he'd have more energy so he could work more, you know, again, kind of contribute to the national effort of transforming the national economy, but also, you know, transforming his, you know, his body and stuff to be more, more healthy, you know, become a better individual, which I thought was quite interesting and kind of like already what my esteemed participants already alluded to all this rests on like, you know, the labor of others of other foreign workers who are, you know, brutally exploited um, in Oman on hydrocarbon like revenues. So you have all these discussions of like knowledge economy, creative industries, but, you know, to what extent can that displace um, Oman's like hydrocarbon economy or you know, is a, you know, remains in uh, check. Yeah, thank you. You know, another um, issue that comes to mind, uh, Ali, I want to pick up on your use of exhaustion, um, which here, again, in a real and a metaphoric way, you kind of so thoughtfully laid out. Uh, and I maybe when I said this before, it came across in a joking way, peak limestone. But I mean, what a better way to actually kind of point to the larger kind of peak resource issues. And so exhaustion being not just of the body of the worker exhaustion in the heat, but exhaustion of like the fire, using all of the fuel, right, reaching the point where like it, it goes out. And so then, you know, thinking about on the other side of this, maybe in a tech optimist kind of way, but innovation will get us out of this or entrepreneurship and you know, these kind of bloated, broad, um, framings. And so between these ideas and also our substances that limit our physical world, all of you, I mean, I think in different capacities also brought up the government, these top-down controls, um, the ways that the state is maybe approaching in your very different research, um, these economic development um, goals. And so I was wondering if you might maybe kind of continue something you were saying or offer something else of kind of government intervention or support, um, perhaps of, of, you know, Ali, in your case, you're talking about the subsidies for um, state projects, right? And entrepreneurship, I'm guessing across the larger GCC as this kind of broad um, entity that they they want to support and so just kind of the the government and states in involvement in this if you guys might say something more hmm. that's a it's a great question and i think it's a great question because it's it's one of those things where there's a narrative about the labor in the gulf and this narrative spans 200 maybe 300 years which is consistently obfuscated from any part of cultural, even co just cultural development in the region. I mean, for example, you get a lot of promotion of the idea of pearling and the pearling industry. And with the exception of Qatar, I don't think any of the states in the Gulf talk about the huge dependency on slave labor and indentured service that that particular industry depended on. And so, and I mean, that's, that's let's say that older aspect of the history. Now, maybe talking about kind of Firas and Amman, in the early, in the, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, a lot of laborers in Bahrain were Omani. So people who were used to building in the tradition, at least so local building materials within the Gulf and also people who had been listed back and forth between Bahrain, Bushehar, Bandar Langia. So kind of local construction uh, techniques within the region. And it was in the early 20th century that increasingly kind of under British control, those the kind of the movement of laborers within the within the region and movement of craftsmen and mason within the region was 
increasingly shifted towards the sourcing of labor engineers from India and Iraq and Basra and Baghdad, uh, consult the kind of creating a path dependency on consultants and within that creating a labor market that was kind of coming in from India from that also the the dependency on those consultants and then those consultants dependency on laborers from elsewhere. And so there's a larger narrative. And then in the 50s with union busting, in the 60s, 70s, also with further union busting, preventing kind of forms of collective labor. And so there's a narrative that spans 200 years of this kind of complete whittling down and diffusion of, of labor narratives. Um, and so by the time we get to today, I mean, whether you, it's the banning of Walid Raad from, from speaking or it's just the fact that these conversations don't enter the narrative, it's we can look at them today as a human rights issue, and it absolutely is, but it really it's it's a larger kind of narrative that not only is kind of germane to the, our governments, but it's in fact almost like a post-colonial condition that we've been living for so long that we forget that um, that we forget almost where it begins and why it begins and what it does. And I think um, it's such it's a longer conversation on really how we imagine our almost a, even just collectivity. It's not even just about labor, but the co entire composition of the society and it's and its value chain. So maybe to just talk about the government thing, to me, yeah, it's there's been a consistent effort of ensuring that there's no kind of improvement of labor conditions. And it's not entirely a native condition. In fact, it's largely a product of, I mean, the same way that the, the, the strange conditions of laborers exist, we can say the same thing for consultants, expatriates, and the kind of the white collar economy, which also has largely remained untouched since 1958 in Bahrain, 1959. Um, colonial or worker, like white collar specialists within the larger region, the India, the Indian subcontinent, and the Gulf, who've shifted into becoming consultants. Many of the practices even remain the same sometimes. Um, Jane Wilson becomes another practice, becomes another practice. Um, so I think it's a whole kind of reimagining of just that production. Maybe not to kind of go too long, but it's like, I also think it's fundamentally sometimes it's even a value thing. I mean, the idea of hand hand labor and hand crafts should actually be valued way more, but somehow we devalue we devalue it intentionally. I'll give one really kind of dumb example. Uh, we went when we were printing a publication uh, for the Oslo Triennial. We 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 got a bunch of quotes, and obviously the, the cheapest quotes in, in Europe you'd get are typically Estonia. Sometimes you'd get cheap quotes from B Belgium, but usually it's Eastern Europe. But we found what, what we found in Bahrain was it was offset printing was cheaper than digital printing. Now, in most parts of the world, offset printing, which is more labor intensive, would be more expensive um, because it actually requires preparing the plates and then running the printer with those plates. So you'd be running the print for CMYK uh, as opposed to a digital printer, which can just print it in one go. But for some reason, it was more expensive in Bahrain, partially because the toner is more expensive, but primarily because it was it was a newer machine. And so they had wanted to kind of up the prices and, and kind of get their money back on that machine. And so in a, in a weird way, yeah, the fact that things that even globally that are more expensive are cheaper because of these weird value, uh, you know, the, the, the value spectrums is, is, is a strange thing. And it's not just a, a value thing. It's, it's really also a narrative where value is placed. And that narrative has been shifted, shaped, shaped over a hundred years of, of kind of external forces. Sorry, long answer. Yeah. No, that's great. Can I jump in? I would just say that, uh, you know, urbanization in Qatar is driven by the government. The government is the client. And that is true to varying degrees throughout the Gulf, right? Some, some countries follow uh, the Qatar model more closely and other countries have uh, kind of a hybrid model of urbanization. But one of the things that is really fascinating in this urbanization is um, that it is increasingly, I think, defining the patterns for, for smart cities and for um, sustainable cities. Um, so uh, these, you know, the Gulf ends up being this space of experimentation for architects and planners around the world, you know, these global consultants, if you if you want to uh, connect to Ali's comment. Um, and so, you know, Qatar, for example, Lusail is the largest smart city in the world today. Um, and it, it, it is built around all of these, you know, part of what, what the smart city logic is, is to be a sustainable city. There's central air conditioning, there's, there's all of this like internet of things to monitor energy usage, 
uh, there's a water recycling system there, right? Like it goes on and on. Uh, there are other parts of uh, Qatar's development uh, project map that are also like highly sustainable. Uh, the downtown redevelopment has been like a model of, of green, green redevelopment. But this is primarily for the elites. These, you know, in a sense, Qatar is defining sustainable smart cities as elite spaces so that sustainability, um, ecological protection is an elite product. And that those who build these cities are exposed to the worst ravages of the climate and, and uh, experience no climate protection. So it, it is repackaging the government in its push to create these sustainable spaces as part of its development model is actually um, re repackaging sustainability as an elite product. And again, ironically funded by hydro hydrocarbon revenues, which are having all sorts of impacts around the world, which then help Qatar source cheap labor, which is exposed to the worst climate effects. So, and that is a government policy. Um, I guess in my context, uh, we're talk, we think of about entrepreneurship and I, this would, uh, I imagine, apply with the other Gulf states, you know, entrepreneurship as a strategy of like macroeconomic uh, planning. So um, in the money context, like others, this means about creating opportunities in different economic sectors. So, for example, um, in Oman, they're really pushing like tourism, which is, you know, kind of under a question mark in light of climate change um, and all of that. But it's creating these opportunities for Omani entrepreneurs to kind of like create new new businesses. Um, not all of them knowledge economy, but like in tourism, um, in, in heritage, that's another big one that's uh, popping up or in places like the Dukum, the new seaport that has been built and it's you know attracting new businesses from around the world or the new healthcare cities whose status i'm not quite sure what's happening there but you know again the idea of attracting that foreign uh capital attracting that hopeful you know future um omani talent so they're yeah, very much a, a, a top-down process uh, but it's also a part of this strategy of, you know, shift, you know, shifting the economy away, supposedly from, you know, the state capitalist model of like state intervention, increasing the role of the private sector. But, you know, obviously, uh, everything is funded by the state, like, you know, these hydrocarbons. So I recall just from many conversations with government um, workers who are handing out these uh, kind of funds to, to fund these entrepreneurial um, businesses and whatnot. And they just kind of commented how most of these businesses will fail, um, you know, and they'll be on the hook to, um, you know, to pay, pay the bill. So they, you know, so. Great, thank you. Um, for everyone in the audience, um, in this, in, in Zoom world, I, we wanted to open it up for you. I don't see any questions in the chat. If anyone wants to voice something, I want to encourage you not to be shy. This isn't necessarily a, uh, this is just a conversational space. You can raise your hand. You can continue to, to message something there. Um, while you all are thinking of, of questions, I wanted to come back. Ali, to, did you have something? No. Um, Ali, I wanted to come back to... Um, maybe the first part of your talk, not to let it slide away. And I guess a couple of things, my, my prior comment of, you know, I love bringing together people from, from different disciplines. And I think having, you know, a, an, an architect, an artist and a practice that, that's very different. And also I just wanted to say the photographs were very beautiful in what you showed. But the whole first part of your talk, let's, you know, coming back to this interior piece of land, um, and maybe just focusing on land itself, um, this connection with fire, with air, with these elements that, that surround us. And um, I guess, you know, one thing that I, I kept thinking about was just this, this connection with, 
with heritage. And one thing that I was struck with when, when you were talking about this piece of land was how close it was to the sea. I think you said 15 minutes at, at any point. Um, and I was wondering if you might just say a little bit more about that um, as you see it maybe fitting into like the, the larger group, your, your project on that, that piece of land. Hmm. If I understand your question correctly, it's it's maybe talking about the larger, yeah, the actual kind I, of imaginaries around the landscape. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I feel like maybe part hmm. of what we've been talking about is maybe a little bit more the second part of your talk. And I didn't sure, want sure. to elide or, or skip over that because I think there was also so many kind of connected themes there of the built environment almost you saying that by way of this being a space of energy infrastructure, it was somehow protected, but then was also this space in certain months where people would kind of go and camp and connected with an idea of the nation and heritage. But then you also kind of then say this encroachment of maybe not permanent structures, but the mobile McDonald's and a trailer. I, I just wanted to maybe hear more about the this designation of land or also how you guys kind of as a larger collective of architects are approaching it or, or thinking about it yeah it's to me it's a it's an it's a site of kind of ongoing fascination because it's it, it embodies many of these kind of contradictions both cultural and spatial that that i that we see in the gulf and to me it's still kind of an ongoing question of what it means and what it kind of I get this foreboding sense whenever I go and so what it means for the future, but maybe just to kind of pull back to a, pre a previous point. I mean, one of the things that has come, come out within this year is that a few of the Gulf countries want to, they have an aim of, of kind of reaching kind of being a carbon neutrality by 2060. And yet a lot of the measures that they kind of imagine are in fact not carbon neutral measures. It's just kind of a way of offsetting. So I mean, it's, planting uh, several million trees or planting mangroves uh, efforts. Well, I mean, the mangroves may be less so, but a lot of the planting of trees will only kind of increase the need for desalinated water, raising future sewage effluent. So in fact, there are things that maybe on one level might present a sort of uh, image of carbon neutrality, but on, on the other hand, end up being kind of even increasing the emissions of carbon. It's just the way, the, way, the way they've been factored. And so I think about that also in the context of the desert, where some, there's some spaces that instead of, I mean, this is maybe kind of me thinking out loud, but instead of the, the, the greening, the fact that you can kind of continue using that oil infrastructure, at least for a place for local camping, I mean, before it gets too electricity intensive and becomes even more kind of energy intensive. But for a while in this kind of early 2000s, it at least embodied this idea that you can kind of go reduce the electricity use and just be outside camping within this oil infrastructure. So somehow there was a moment where at least recreationally it became kind of a public park, as opposed to this image of, greening and thus using kind of planting as a way of justifying your carbon emissions there's almost a celebration of it saying look look it's here it's part of this arab narrative in the 20th century so let's just enjoy being around this oil infrastructure which is it's so surreal i mean it's also not particularly healthy but somehow the celebration of that narrative saying look there's emissions we're not carbon neutral but let's not try to hide it and let's just enjoy it it's, it's completely surreal and it's almost like a blade runner condition but in a way that's it's a way of being apologetic without making a kind of a false apology. And that's kind of what I enjoyed about it. But I presented it primarily because to me, it's an ongoing question. It's, it's both a question of let's say, the possibility of the future and the kind of the concerns of the present. Um, and it's, to me, it's a space that's still kind of latent with these imaginaries that need to be unpacked. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think, um all of you, whether it's the imaginary or the future, or, you know, I think the way that oftentimes the Gulf in a fictive, but also a real way becomes this space of trying things out of the smart, of the sustainable, of global, you know, labor practices. Um, one question we have in the chat, and um, I see that Natasha has already um, graciously plugged an article she wrote, there was a, was a question that I might even expand to all three of you of just kind of changes in terms of COVID. And so I think Fidel's question was maybe specifically about 
um, issues related to labor, probably labor rights and protest, but also maybe to just extend this, um, you know, as we are here on Zoom, which might have been unimaginable before in terms of entrepreneurship, digital entanglements, um, if there might also in terms of, of this post COVID moment, any of kind of ramifications in the context that you guys are talking about. I'm happy to jump in because I actually thought about this a lot. Um, so, you know, one of the really interesting things that happened when COVID first emerged from in the early days of the pandemic is that Qatar established a cordon sanitaire around the industrial area um, and did not permit um, movement in and out of that area except for uh, work, right? So workers were bussed in and out of the, the industrial area to continue to work on construction sites, but things like food deliveries, medical care, um, were not allowed within the cordon sanitaire. So workers were, were literally going hungry because there were no food deliveries. There was no testing, there was no, um, there was no provision of care for workers who did get COVID. And, uh, you know, not unexpectedly, uh, the cordon sanitaire, the, the area within the cordon sanitaire became kind of a hotspot for COVID. Um, so that most of the COVID cases in Qatar were localized in the cordon sanitaire. Um, and it was another way of using um, external conditions, whether it's climate or pandemics, to reinforce the sense of exclusion. So much so that workers who were seeking care were often picked up and detained and deported. Um, workers were also not able to return home uh, under pandemic conditions, even though Qatar has now rolled back the provision uh, that uh, required workers to have an exit visa to leave the country. So the cordon sanitaire has softened since then. It just, it's not uh, so functional now, uh, although there are still differences in, you know, where people can access care, how people can access care. Um, and certainly exposure is differential in, in, in much the same ways that it is that it has been all around the world. But here was a deliberate, um, intentional government policy to harden the exclusion through a public health measure. Um, and again, in the ways that Qatar is kind of a window onto our future, or maybe even onto our present, it's not dissimilar, for example, from the way that Title 42 is used on the US-Mexico border um, as a use of uh, a health uh, challenge to harden exclusion. Um, and so I'll leave it there. Thanks. No pressure for either of you, just if there were something that comes to mind, a comment, a connection. I mean, building on what Natasha said, I mean, something unfolded similarly in Oman as well with regard to, to the workers. I mean, just, you know, the abuse, exploitation, you know, unable to leave the country, starving, all around terrible things. But I recall now talking to some friends and, you know, who work in the government ministries now shifting to, you know, kind of remote working and just complaining of, you know, attending endless like Zoom meetings. I mean, similar, you know, not dissimilar to what happens here in the United States uh, as well, but kind of that, that stark uh, differentiation between like, you know, the, the more privileged white collar or government worker vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, kind of the blue collar, well, the exploited uh, uh, foreign workers at Noman. This is maybe a small point, uh, and I'll kind of state it quickly, but one of the things that was, I mean, I think Natasha touched upon the, uh, the dynamics of the labor camps and the issues of the labor camps quite well. Uh, maybe I won't add on that in terms of Bahrain, but one of the kind of bizarre things that had also happened in the pandemic, just to kind of talk about the larger kind of thing, also as a, as a Gulf pandemic rather than just from country to country, was one of the things that we saw in Bahrain was that for a while in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, 
they were not allowing flights back from India. And so what was happening was that Bahrain was becoming this kind of transit zone where someone would come to Bahrain. And he, I mean, you'd have, you'd have like 40, 50 people or a plane full come to Bahrain, isolate for about uh, a week or two, and then would take a bus or, um, or a car into Saudi Arabia or into Kuwait or fly them into Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. And so for this moment of about, I want to say four or five months, there was this small hotel hospitality economy centered around uh, labor returning to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, uh, maybe also the UAE, but I'm not sure. Um, and it was a whole thing, right? It was, it was from the airport to the PCRs that they'd have to do to their quarantine. And so it was also a strange thing where, I mean, there's already this kind of dependencies in, in the Gulf, or at least Bahrain, for example, in Saudi Arabia in terms of tourism. But it was strange that as a way of offsetting the, the loss of tourism, you kind of had to pick up the sort of my, uh, labor tourism. I mean, I wouldn't call it tourism, but this way of almost subsidizing that economy. You also had it to the Saudis that wanted to get back into Saudi for a while, too. But, I mean, this is a small note and maybe not so much related to the kind of the spectrum of exhaustion, but also the fact that these things aren't happening in isolation, but they're almost these intra-Gulf dynamics that allow for also somehow economic repair or recovery to happen. So they'll impose something in Saudi and another country nearby might use it as a way of just of, of a little windfall. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's not even, even this labor thing is not just a dynamic within each country. It's almost somehow a shared thing. I'm not sure how much of it was meant to be an intentional windfall for the Bahrain hotel industry, but it, it ended up being one just kind of propping up the country's uh, hospitality for six, eight months where you'd have hotels fully booked. You yeah, know, uh, Ali, thank you for that. And I mean, I think one thing here in, uh, for those of you that have attended as we wrap up um, or have seen the videos, one thing we were trying to get at when the element series, you can see how air and earth, um, you know, even have strongly for me resonated in this conversation, but these relationships, these kind of ecological flows back and forth. And so even in Ali's comments of um, relationships, flows of labor and bodies in the GCC, and it made me think of Natasha's comment, even of, you know, these labor practices of recruitment, of how this works. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. And in lieu of anyone raising their hand, um, and a couple people are, are streaming out. I think that's probably a good place to leave it. I wanted to thank you three so much for joining, for offering your thoughts. Um, and I will stop the recording here.